So this session is really um, when we think about this idea of experience and experience design, the power is really, it's all about context. It's about taking the, the job that one is doing and it, it, for whatever development we need them to have, creating the context that's like their real life job. The closer we can match the activity in the sim, the better the cues that are in the experience, the better or the easier it's going to be for us to create the opportunities for practice and retrieval. So what happens when the issue at, at hand is we're launching a new piece of software. We've decided to go with SAP. And now we've got an opportunity to, we need to change the way people do certain activities in their job. Now some of those activities are keystroke. It's about knowing the software, knowing when to use, what, to, what buttons to push, where to put things. But sometimes the issue is when, with whom. There's context involved in the decisions that are made or the activities that are done when the software is being used. So it struck me as odd that, in fact, there is so much, there are a lot of capabilities, and by the way, I'm going to be presenting with my colleague, uh, Mike Graham, who is the CEO of Epilogue Systems, um, and which is a company that does software sim, uh, and I'll turn it over to him in a moment. Uh, there are lots of capabilities out there in terms of simulating the software so that you can learn that activity. But they are not necessarily blended with the context. You learn the software kind of in a vacuum. And the challenge that the, the data has shown, as I can probably check with our SAP colleagues here, that when an SAP type, any kind of ERP system, gets implemented, rarely is it because of the software, right, that the project fails, or fails to meet objectives, or doesn't get done on time. Okay, it's not about the software, right? <laughs> it's about how it's implemented. <laughs> okay? And it really has to do with some of that. So that's what this is what, what led me to it led us to this conversation really is how do we take what is typically thought of as a separate set of tasks, a separate set of activities, and to blend them, to bring the application of the software with the context of its implementation together so that you can actually experience using it in the context of the real job. If it's a, a call center and you are dealing with customer, you're, you're a customer service rep, you're dealing with customers and you have the opportunity now you have to look up their record, I can't just train you on the looking up the record and the CRM software and not have the context of talking to a customer when they're telling me you're wrong. I am a not a credit, I'm not a credit risk, but the software says it does. How do you then deal with dealing with the system, dealing with the context, and that's what we're really here to talk about today. Now, these are ideas we haven't yet fully implemented, so we're very interested in your feedback. How many of you, by the way, are involved in implementing systems, software systems? Okay, how many of you know people in your organizations that do? And do you interact with them, or are they a separate department? They're in your department? <coughs> Separate. Separate? Okay. So I'm interested in, in, in validating some of these ideas um, and uh, you know, certainly continuing to explore them. So we're going to talk about making the case for integrating the two approaches, discussion and the value of software sim, review, because a lot of, we've talked about a lot, uh, soft skill sim, and then looking at um, the ways in which we can integrate. And what are some of the options? So, I live on the left, Ken and Meg's Learn, and many of you live on the right. And what's interesting is, uh, we have, uh, I'm not going to pick on SAP, although we've been involved in about 450 SAP projects, while we've been on Oracle. Okay. Oh, oh, good. Okay, <laughs> we've got a lot of those too. But, it's interesting that, it, you know, we rarely run across an organization where the skill set in this room, uh, many of which are involved on the right, are interacting with those that, that live on the left and have to transfer knowledge in volume to hundreds, if not 
thousands, if not tens of thousands, of, of workers, employees, and users of Oracle or SAP or many, many other applications. I mean, these are applications. Uh, uh, we have a hospital that's spending, you know, three hundred million dollars uh, as I speak on implementing their electronic health record system, and. Uh, and, and, and the left doesn't exist, and the right doesn't exist, and I think they're going to struggle for all the reasons we know. And uh, so we live on the left, and it's, it's, you think it should be easy. It's all about you know, known things, known policies, known procedures, known you know, keyboard strokes, uh, known operational instructions in a variety of areas, and here's some examples. Uh, but software application is an area of key expenditure, key impact, heavy impact on company's productivity, and so that's where my company lives, and that's where we try to help companies in terms of transferring hard knowledge in terms of how to utilize these mega, mega systems, and uh, there's ways that we do it, but we have been increasingly been hearing from our customers that it's not enough. It's not enough just to understand that we have documented 3,000 transactions in the system and made them available to our employees. That's, that's not enough. There's a context that's missing. So on the soft side, where many of us reside, we focus on dealing with those skills, with, uh, how to deal with that customer service call, how to uh, have those conversations, how to deal with projects from a soft skill standpoint. And oftentimes we focus on the skills, but not necessarily as much on the specific context in which it's applied. Because we end up needing to um, genericize so that it's applicable to wider audiences, and not necessarily, we don't actually live with the software, so we don't necessarily think to integrate it in. But when you think about the stuff that Will talked about yesterday, and you think about these, like, how do we set this up? How do we create a context in which the cues, the practice, the retrieval are all set up so that you can actually, when I'm sitting there at the software, I can be reminded of, oh yeah, this is what I'm going to have to do this. And be able to increase the probability. I mean, there's a significant investment. Most companies have spent a lot of money buying their, these wonderful systems. They're designed to be very, very powerful, to manage entire enterprises, and so they're gonna be a little complicated to execute. Now, how do we, in, not to ensure, we can't, again, we can't ensure anything, but we can increase the probability of success if people are better able to use it. So in terms of setting the stage, I've probably covered a bunch of these. So experience is the best teacher, right? So here we're talking about experience with the software. So experience obviously more broadly, but context is going to be important. So software simply is going to provide experience of the software, but not necessarily the context. And again, the data, there's lots of data out there that talks about why large system implementations fail to meet their objectives. So ultimately, many end up being successful, but they didn't get there in time, or they got there way over budget. Um, again, so they do actually get there. And most of the time, when you look at the, the, the data that's out there, it's about the change management, it's about the implementation, the project management, the, the, the way that the, product, the project was deployed is where some of the things fall down. It is in the context of how the software is applied, not necessarily the software itself. There also may be opportunities when thinking about this contextually that we can have provide the vendors better information about what needs to happen in the software, because maybe the software wasn't exactly right, but you don't know that until it's actually in context. So typically, training around software is given to IT or those who are the project managers associated with the software implementation, and that's because they focus on software process. Context falls to more of a soft skill, that uh, an HRD type or uh, an OD type side of the business, and they're focusing on the contextual part. But not necessarily, and, and somebody mentioned that they're in the same department, that's great. Sometimes it is the same people, but oftentimes it's not. And so what happens is we need to find a way to allow these teams to communicate. One of the things we talked about yesterday in, in Mike Herzog's talk about the IT side of things, people who are in IT, as smart and as capable as they are, oftentimes are not necessarily... Um, Yes, okay, I, I was hoping somebody would chime in with a word that I wouldn't offend. For any, again, look, the soft skills are really not their, their key skill set, necessarily. Uh, if, we, if we stereotype, so I, I, I apologize for any really, really good, sensitive, um, soft skill capable IT uh, engineers that may be here. Um, <laughs> but stereotypically, these are not the, these are not the, the most uh, interpersonally capable 
folks. And they're very, very good at the software side, but they don't include context. They don't really care, or they're not sensitive to, because it's just not something that is part of their makeup. So how do we then go about this process of thinking about the experience in a broader way that allows us to take these wonderful tools that are out there and make these tools, the SAP type of Oracle, any kind of ERP system, easier or better implemented? So, I've been in software for a long time, many different kind of applications, not just ERP, but uh, I also mentioned in the healthcare arena, CRM systems, logistics, and on and on. And I hate to say that, uh, I, I wish it were not the case, but that person right there is an end user. And I, I, have, I have rarely seen a situation where that is not how an end user felt, in terms of what's on the screens in front of them, and where they can turn, if anywhere, to find current, accurate, relevant information on what they're supposed to do. So, these are the types of systems that I just referred to. They're, they're core, they're expensive, they take a long time to implement, they, have, they affect a lot of people. Um, one of our customers uh, spent almost $700 million over a many number of years implementing a very, very complex system affecting tens of thousands of employees and then um, um, over a million, several million end users outside of the company that were associated, uh, field people, uh, uh, independents. And, uh, and it was just a nightmare. People got fired from <coughs> the project and, and to this day uh, they struggle in terms of the utilization. Their users are right there. Um, let's see. There we go. There's some, some data. Will and uh, some research that has been done, and it's it's unfortunate. The IDC reports that these types of projects, over two thirds of them, are viewed as failures or are challenged. Um, we also have some some information that indicates what is the single biggest factor as to how to realize value out of these systems, and the single biggest factor is getting effective usage. Effective usage is pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and yet um, it, it seems to, to escape uh, most organizations in terms of allocating the resources and the methods to ensuring that they can affect that their users can effectively utilize the system. And at the end of the day, I don't need to, I'm preaching to the choir. What's the first thing that gets cut? Always. And what percentage is the training budget? That seven hundred million dollar project training. Four million dollars. Four million dollars. Okay. Um, we all know knowledge retention is key. I'm, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the, the various forms of knowledge retention here. I think this is, uh, again, speaking to, to acquire. There are better methods of ensuring that the knowledge is, is cued and it is retained and it is, I'm sorry, will what, uh, and, and re retracted. Right? Retreat. Um, and, and so the, you know, the uh, doing is, is definitely what is needed here. That's what people do with the type of approach that we take. But then more importantly, this is what the soft side of it has to offer. So ideally, ideally, knowledge transfer should be available at the moment of need as the user is working in the software application. Moment of need. Oops. Back to that. Uh, the, the training help and support content should match the level at which the users work. It, it, and users work at what level? They work at the transaction level. And so the, user, the information must be available at that level. And the user should not have to expend effort. I mean, um, every single click that it takes uh, an end user to get to the information they need, there is a percentage of people that will fall away and just will not follow through. And there are some people that if they have to expend any effort, they will not seek the information they need. As a result, we end up with productivity issues, errors, emissions, rework, and, and downstream effect that we don't want. Uh, so we, we have an application that does some things. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm, I'm here to talk about, to just give you enough of a perspective of what we do to understand why we feel we need to bring it to the right side of the equation in terms of the soft skills. Um, normally, uh, 
we, we have a system that can reduce the documentation time of how an application works dramatically. It's just, it's, it's just the application of technology in, in, a, in a way that's currently you know, not widely used in, in most applications. In the ERP world, it is. Uh, the ERP world, SAP and Oracle actually embraced this years ago because of the nature of the issue and the size of their problem. They have systems that comprise, you know, their mega systems, they comprise uh, you know, thousands and thousands of transactions and, and thousands and thousands of workers. So the ERP world actually spawned uh, the, the nature of this type of solution, but it is widely unknown once you start branching out uh, away from ERP. But the nature of the solution actually allows you to document, you know, we had one of our customers, Hershey, Hershey, um, was uh, about to go live, approaching to go live on a, on a major event. And Hershey had a very bad experience back in, in 1999 and 2000 with the, with the deployment of, of their systems, uh, three different systems, and it went very, very, bad, very, very badly. In fact, uh, it, it, you know, they, they, they missed a portion of Halloween in 1999. And Halloween for Hershey is a pretty big deal. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so they wanted to do a lot of things right. Uh, and as they're approaching uh, the relaunch, uh, and, you know, subsequently, they needed, uh, this is, you know, sometime later, they, they, they realized they were in some ways going down the same path. And what was that path? It was the path of being able to enable their end users to be able to utilize their systems because that was in part, part of the problem uh, with uh, what happened previously. The, the, their, their end users could not utilize the system in the, in, in the right fashion and it led to a lot of ripple effects. That wasn't the only problem, but that was a, a, one of their five areas of weakness that they identified with their earlier debacle. At any rate, uh, Hershey, they were realizing this, didn't want to go down that path, and they realized they were about to. Uh, you know, they, they had put our tool in the hands of about 140 subject matter experts, and in a matter of uh, weeks, had documented about 3,000 key transactions. And that's the nature of the tool. But again, what is this? It's, it's at the transaction, how to, what to do, step by step by step by step. But it didn't give the end users the perspective. It didn't give the end users the context, which we're going to talk about. Now, as the technology has emerged over the years, we have embraced simulations. Our product actually generates automatically simulations for all these how-tos, and that's wonderful. You can add audio, you can you know, make them look real sexy, but once again, there are limitations. Our software simulation is nothing like next ones in terms of being able to put a full wrapper around uh, that context. So there is value to software sims of our nature. Software simulations give you the ability to watch and listen and actually play with it and actually be tested on it and, and scored on it. So that's helpful. Simulations of that nature in terms of utilizing software and, and learning how to not make mistakes and, and things like that is very important. Uh, they're, they're far more easier to consume than uh, a manual or even uh, online, on-screen uh, HTML help that says do this, do that, click here, click that. They're, they're certainly a lot easier. Um, uh, as I mentioned, they do uh, actually have expanded into actually uh, you know, validating uh, user proficiency, and, and that's a, an important thing, particularly for areas that have zero tolerance for error. Uh, however, software simulations, they don't address the human context. Let me give you some examples from our customer base. So uh, there's a cosmetic company uh, that uh, has field agents, but these field agents have to interact with their customers, uh, you know, and they're the housewives that they sell to and whatnot. And uh, they have to deal with these people. They have to be proficient in the use of the system in terms of order entry and checking up on orders from people or canceling orders if there's been, you know, a delayed shipment or a wrong thing shipped. They have to be able to deal with that. But there was nothing that really combined these two in terms of of combining the element of handling somebody's order and their shipment with the human element of how to deal with a potentially unsatisfied <coughs> A global call center, a very large company, uh, over 100,000 call agents and call centers around the world. Um, uh, people like Aetna uh, utilize this call center. So if you have Aetna and you call up the 800 customer support number, you, you go to India. And, uh, and these people, have to utilize Aetna's systems in terms of uh, accessing policy information, accessing your information. Um, they, uh, Adobe uh, utilizes this company in terms of their call center. Coca-Cola, many large companies utilize this company for their call centers. The way this company makes money is they 
release people onto these people's system, taking their calls and performing the business. They cannot release employees onto that account until they have been tested and deemed proficient, zero error rate, in the use of the customer's applications. And so um, you know, that's great, and we come into play there, and they can use our simulations for the test taking mode, and they can be tested out, and they can be released on the account, and then they can start making money. The problem is, once again, they're dealing with, if you're a Netflix customer, and you don't, uh, you don't like the claim adjudication that's just happened, and you call up, there's a good chance you're going to be annoyed. And, and there's nothing that merges the necessary competency and the utilization of the system to, 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 to relay information to the caller and dealing with the caller that is one of another culture, it also being taken to India, you're dealing with a US you know, person, and also with the nature of, of why that person is upset. Uh, a hospital system that, that I was referring to. Uh, interesting, very interesting. <coughs> Um, so they, they document how to use the, the electronic health record system, which is very, very common, very, very common, as more or worse than, than the ERP system. And, uh, and what did they find out? That they actually had degradation in their surveys in terms of patient satisfaction with the experience with the clinician. Why? Because the clinician's nose is in the laptop and not orienting to the patient in large part. And so again, there's a, a, a human element, and yet they have to deal with the, the competency issues because they cannot be making errors in terms of the nature of the information that they're interacting with the patient. A retail chain, um, interestingly, uh, used us to create uh, software sims on how to use their talent management system. So that the managers, they actually had a talent management system that the man, sort of like the, the hospital system, they interacted with the uh, talent management system as they were you know, doing the performance review. It, it, was, it was real time. And um, it, was, it was almost, you know, it's just a, a similar sort of thing as the hospital system, is that they had the, the simulations to train them how to use the talent management system, but they had no context in terms of applying that to the actual human element of delivering the performance review. <coughs> so this is, you know, as, as I listen to my customers, you know, talking about this, this is where, you know, the light bulb finally went on with regard to there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way of merging the transfer of hard knowledge for those contexts that have some other element that is, goes beyond just the simple transfer of hard knowledge how to use a system. So now I'll switch over. Now, obviously, we're not talking about this is not the always, right? This is when we take an experience design approach, then these are the various tools in the portfolio. So there's never one answer for anything. But the idea is, is I need to focus on the software, or I need to focus on the software, I need to focus on the context, or I need to focus on the context. And sometimes there's the opportunity to do both. But just, just you know, things that we, we have covered. You know, the idea of getting them emotionally engaged so that there's an opportunity, again, to create those cues which allow for better retrieval. How emotional do we get when we sit there with a software sim when we're dealing with the application? Other than possible boredom or annoyance in terms of using the system, we're not really emotionally engaged. However, if I put you in front of the system and then I make you interact with an irate customer, now I've got some real emotional engagement that may give you additional cues um, to how you're going to use the system. Now what happens if I actually do a keystroke wrong? If I'm in the software, I may get it wrong, I may score badly, but I'm not getting any consequences. If I did it wrong, okay, so I did it wrong, I scored badly, so that I don't feel good about that. But from a st the standpoint of understanding, if I actually got that entry wrong, I could have cost the company X number of dollars. I could have stopped the shipment from making it on time. I could make uh, a hospital doesn't get its reorder completed, and so they don't have necessary product when it. What are some of these consequences that we can actually, and then you have to deal with that. This is one of how we can um, further leverage the combined power of the different kinds of experiences that we may have. And obviously, engagement is going to be key. The software applications, engaging with them is what's important. So how do I get people to want to get involved in those applications? And it may not be that every one is context filled, but at least if I'm part of a story, if I've got that engagement, which I may have done the last time I engaged with them, then they're that much more 
it's that much more probable or possible that you will get them engaged the next time around with the next application. And again, thinking about this more broadly, not necessarily only in the soft school, but we want people to critically think. Don't be mindless about filling in data in the application. I want you to exercise judgment and then experience consequences and be able to give feedback. So when thinking about when, you know, these kind of, Uh, when these kinds of things are going to be, this is kind of a, just a, a summary list of when context is going to be important, when <coughs> taking this kind of approach is going to be uh, specifically. So there are some applications which, no, just learn the software. <coughs> context is really not all that, uh, not all that critical. Or there are times that context is not all that critical. But here's some things as far as when it is going to be that you really, really want to be thinking about blending the two. And again, you know, just coming back to this graphic, you've seen it quite a number of times already. But the idea that any way that we can continue adding these practice over time is going to ensure that we're going to get that much better. And that we're actually thinking about what we're doing. We want to make this intuitive, right? We don't want it to be a burden every time you open up the software. You want to know, okay, if, if I get this kind of call, I know exactly where I need to go <coughs> in the system so that I can actually get my job done so I can be more productive because I'll be that much quicker about doing things. So the opportunity to start <coughs> facing these, and again, that sometimes it's going to be only software sim, sometimes it's going to be only soft skill sim, <coughs> but over time, in that to, to manage that curve and maintain that retention level, the reactivation opportunities, that's going to be something where we can mix, and really is thinking about the broader experience that you want people to have. And so, again, coming back to the idea of creating an experience, you know, some of the tools that you have within the, the tools of building these things, but the tools that you have to manage this idea of creating an experience includes the power of storytelling. You have the context as it plays out, but you also have the software as it flows. You have a business process. I mean, the wonderful thing about, for me, in, in, in spending time with Mike, is learning how, you know, the starting point really is mapping out the business process. I mean, any kind of simulation where you're capturing a day in the life, a week in the life, understanding the business process flow is key because that, in essence, becomes your timeline that you're going to simulate along. So being able to capture that um, is going to be important. Understand the consequences. They ought to be memorable and potentially <coughs> provocative. Right? You can have a lot of fun with these. Feedback, scorecard. Um, I'll show you an example of this in a second. And, uh, and narrative feedback. So in terms of having those opportunities, <coughs> as I mentioned yesterday, in terms of the timing of the feedback is obviously something you take into account, but having narrative feedback that explains why what you did was good or what wasn't good, and what you can do or make reference to where you can learn more for uh, further development in terms of things going well. You want to take this one? This is your slide, but I'll take it. <laughs> We're still working on the routine here. <laughs> now, and this is the, the idea that, you know, one of the things that, that even in our, um, in our speak, we got caught up in a little mindlessness uh, focusing totally on simulation, right? Because I'm, I'm that carpenter with the hammer in my hand and everything looks like a sim. But the idea is, is that fundamentally, in, in this context, sometimes context is just e-learning. Right? Sometimes there is teach, there is instructional, and it's not all about SIM. And sometimes you might go from uh, the business process mapping tool and capturing the business flow, but that then becomes the input for an e-learning module. And if I can go from an output, of power, <coughs> an output into PowerPoint and import the PowerPoint and create an e-learning module, isn't that easy? Or won't that be straightforward? If in the same activity of thinking through the business process, what it is that needs to be done, and I have at my fingertips or within my team the ability to think not only capture the, the technical or the tactical keystroke aspect, but also to do, to do the teaching around the context and then even further to do the actual application and the, and the simulation. That's the kind of thing, that's the kind of power that we're looking to establish that that is something that becomes part of a single conversation as opposed to several different steps across several different departments across whatever it is that ends up not getting done or not getting done well. And so the idea of, of working through a process that starts with, with understanding the business process that you're building skills around 
and then being able to extend that into the different, ver the different types of applications that you may need to provide the skills to the people that you're targeting. Did I capture that right? Your slides did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to show you a quick example. Um, this is something that was developed some time ago uh, with my friends at RWD. Um, and and the, again, the idea of creating an example of what might that look like from a simulation perspective if we were to actually capture, to blend both into a single um, application. I cannot see the whole screen. So this was not done in SimWriter, so excuse me, excuse me, Dennis. So. Um, but again, from a, the standpoint of, and there's no, this is not no media at all, so it's uh, text-driven. And again, this was kind of thrown together, so it's not fully, uh, but just it demonstrates the point. So welcome to the customer service sim. The simulation was created to assist in developing critical thinking in order to make thoughtful decisions and use best practices in the means of ensuring high customer satisfaction. So this is built around. Um, uh, Customer service, CRM system implementation, and let's get to work. So, um, in this case, that, that slide was there's no back button because part of, again, the idea we can't stop people from making mistakes, but we can prepare them for how to deal with it when they do it, so there's no mulligans, right? From a design perspective, the idea of uh, forcing people, even when they make a mistake, to deal with it is instructive. So, you're Eric, Ace Office Supplies, you're new to the job. Okay, we don't spend too much time on this. Sir, your supervisor, your beginning of shift meeting, customer's always right, remember the number one rule. So you plug in, you're ready to go, and you get a call, your first call. Hi, my name is Mary Ann. I work for Slippery Slope Construction Company. My order number is whatever. I'm calling because I would like to triple the size of my order and add expedited overnight delivery. Can you use my company credit card to process the additional charges? Can you help me? What do you do next? So here, okay, so now we're dealing with a contextual sim customer service. We're dealing with how to deal with um, how to deal with customers. So, what do you do? Okay, let's, let's take a quick vote. Who wants to do one? Tell Marianne you'd be happy to help her. Okay, put Marianne on hold. Okay, and ask Marianne to bear with you while you access her account. Okay, well, let's go with one. So, before Marianne hangs up and says, Thank you for your excellent service, I look forward to receiving your call soon. Goodbye. After you hang up, you reflect on your training. You know the next step is to review Slippery Slope's credit information. So here's where you'd actually launch the software set. And so now we're going to go through, in the context of the call that we just made, we're now going to go through a quick sim on using the Siebel tool in terms of looking up a customer interaction, a customer, uh, a customer record. So I'm not going to do the keystroke activity required in terms of my um, being able to get some practice on, now I've seen the customer record, and now I can go back to the sim in terms of, now the real data isn't in there. Now this is obviously not a, this is a kluji fix. We have two different simulations running. They are linked, but not, um, they're not in the same screen. So after reviewing Slippery Slope's account, you find the company's credit rating has been dropped due to delays in receiving payment. The company is now a lower tier of customers and does not qualify for expedited delivery. What do you do now? So now we've created a context in which I'm giving you some customer service training. I've given you an opportunity to look up a record and see what you do with the information. You see that maybe uh, you need to look at the record before you let her get off the phone, possibly. Um, but what are you gonna do? And so now we can get in some additional training. Now one of the things I just wanna click through this real quickly. And I, I can make this sim available to you to play uh, if you want to see it a little bit more. But at the end, you're going to get your feedback. So this is a model built on delayed feedback, so not on, on giving immediate feedback uh, in the decisions that you make. But here, so these were the these were the what was being measured when you played. 
So I'm giving you software training, but what I'm actually doing at the end of the experience is giving you a sense of how well you did at customer satisfaction, call handling time, and, advance, and how, do you, how well did you adhere to corporate strategy. <clears throat> uh, so the idea, again, of giving people, setting these cues that the software, understanding the software is going to actually have, which may be intuitive, it's some, not rocket science here, but the idea of creating that direct link so that now I actually may go and take the software sim on its own because I want to make sure, because I now have a better sense of how this will help me with call handling time. Which means that when I'm measured at the end of the day with how many calls I took during the day or managed during the course of a day, that I actually will get better reports. But now I've created the story, I've created the opportunities for engagement, I've created the context, and this will hopefully allow to create um, better usage of both sides as well as the integrated side. Yes? Okay, so this isn't built yet. So at this point, this was just on the soft skills. We've used the within, you know, Epilogue has a way of measuring the technical skills. So we're looking still at ways that <coughs> you can absolutely get both. Well, that is it. So if you have questions. Well, actually, we, we were also hoping to throw it up to you guys because, you know, this is relatively new. There, the, you know, the ability to take hard learning and incorporate it into a very linear, straightforward e-learning capability exists. You can use a variety of tools for that. But in terms of you know what you've seen the last few days and, and the broader capability of the next learn tool, uh, you know, we're really interested in understanding whether you perceive value in this and whether you can marry the right side of that first slide with the left side because in many organizations they are different skill sets and they're in different areas of the organization. And is do you see value? Do you, if you see both sides of the equation, do you see value? If you don't, you know, how do you how do you bring this to your colleagues on the other side? The question I have is when you did the hard skill sets, you were just using the mouse clicks. You do that with the hot air or something like that. Is there some way to take text input as well? Mm -hmm. in, in, when you say text, yeah, for sure. Text input. On the on the keystrokes on the software yeah. side. Yeah. I mean, I did have to type in flip pretty slow, but I think that in the epilogue system, which again, we will ultimately be building um, an integrated uh, demo. Uh, <coughs> that there is no, that capability in terms of creating the, the different kinds, because you can actually choose what kind of sim you want, whether it's just a learning, whether it's a test, whether it's a, a demo, um, so that uh, you can integrate the various activities that you need them to be doing, and then uh, enable them to practice in that way. So it's really a function, is it, you know, the, the conversation is, is it an assessment, or is it an evaluation, and you pick the right mode for uh, to build into the right sim. Yes? I have a comment and a question. Uh, first off, I would think that the people who you would be designing the two different systems, are, or especially the hard core people, are probably very, very different. They're probably not going to be too thrilled about the idea of you making them touchy-feely about some of this stuff. So that's a comment. Second one is, um, do you think you would get pushback from companies saying, well, yeah, that soft skill stuff is nice, but we really want to get them to learn how to use our system. Because that's the most important thing. Um, and there you've got a culture. <coughs> uh, what, do you, what is your perception of how people are going to react to that kind of thing? Well, um, it, it's a second stage thing. Um, yes, the first is transferring the hard knowledge because we need to get people using this extremely expensive, complex system now that affects every aspect of our business. So yes, transferring the hard knowledge is the first stage. Oh, okay. What tends to happen that we're seeing is that, and is that for customers that have done that and have, uh, feel like they're doing it well, they do begin to think, well, okay, we're doing this, and yet there are some areas uh, that you know it's just not getting there, or or it's just you know they're they're starting to think beyond, and they're starting to think about a different type of effectiveness. They're thinking about the you know the contextual effectiveness beyond just the right entry. Of, of data and the right processing of uh, information. So it's a second stage thing we're finding. Yeah, I think that having this as a first conversation, you know, can be very difficult. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just going to say, I think this is exactly on the right track for what we're doing. Business needs right now. I can't speak for other types of organizations. But business needs this. <clears throat> Invariably, what happens is after the system is taught, company will track the number of defects or the amount of handling time and they'll discover that they want to improve those metrics. Right. And if you do the root cause analysis, it's typically they don't have the business process knowledge 
or they don't have the soft skills to execute within the system what they need to. Right. And as a result of that, then you typically have to go out with this type of approach, whether it's a process expert who teaches the system or a process of where a systems person who's using soft skills training you need knowledge of both so they can get the full context. Right. You know, so we need to, that's the feedback. I think it's exactly the right direction. I would just follow up to say that 10 years ago I did a study for a sub Florida which indicated 53 companies said the single biggest problem was lack of soft skills in their employees. But it's like the weather. When I when we proposed and showed a way to solve it, they went, oh, that's, ew, that's pretty yucky. I don't think I want to do that. That's too expensive. Well, that's, too, that's not quick enough. Well, that's too, you know, so it's clearly a big problem. Uh, it's just that people willing to engage it. Well, I think the comment back here it, 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 it creates a situation that's maybe more palatable in terms of where to focus. Um, you know, by a lot of these people addressing this as a, as a, as a subsequent stage issue, uh, you, you begin to understand and do cause analysis to isolate where this is because we can't, we can build software SIMs and other forms of software documentation that are delivered contextually to the users in the thousands, in the tens of thousands, <coughs> and we do. You can't build 10,000 next learn simulations, you can't. You need to apply this this melding of the hard and soft in the in those areas that are, are really a focus for um, you know I, we, we have large companies that you know are very proud of the fact that they built ten of these things you know they're they're high cost and, and, and such uh, so you know this is this is a low volume solution we believe to a high exposure problem that has been identified within the organizations as opposed to you know not, you know, getting it at the, at the transaction level. Yes. I've seen in some experiences with call centers where, you know when you call and they say, this call is being recorded for training. Um, when we use snippets of actual calls, and, and so rather than having a sim where people are reading, you know, people get on a headset, mm -hmm. and they hear that entry statement from the customer, and then the screen pops up. And we had to take the fully visible <coughs> path, but I could see how you could real call scripts and <coughs> divergent paths based on you know, kind of putting them in the context of being on the phone and hearing. Do you, in your organization, can you see who might be empowered to, to attempt that? As, uh, in, in terms of, of bringing these together? I mean, it was brought together by the learning and development organization because, um, you know, it's financial services. So it's a highly emotional call. So people call the markets now and 800 This person has just lost half their retirement, you know, in their 70s. So, how do you talk to that person? So, we use, and it was really very moving because some of the people on the calls were actually was it, crying, you know, upset. And my daughter's getting married, and I don't, you know, the, the fund is. You know, this is fine. I mean, like we're talking about call center, uh, customer service, soft skills, people, dealing with people. But a lot of the times, some of us deal with like really technical stuff. Like for example, going back to the uh, Florida Department of Transportation, collecting workway data. And part of the problem is that they want it to be quick and they want it to zero in right on the processes. So an alternative way of looking at it in terms of context is to give them what to identify the business process and then identify what are the most important tasks they have to do on the job and then create a scenario not necessarily with the soft skills but in our case we use okay you have to inventory or collect data on this roadway and then you take that scenario and what are the different tasks to break down including uh, operating or entering the data into the computer and when, you, when it's time for them to enter the data into the computer, you bring up a roadway again. This is where you collect this data, and this is why you put it in this way. So the, in my point being, context can exist in different forms. Yes. And you can only start with the task analysis and going yes. identifying the task-based um, task standard learning, basically. Yeah, and we have customers that, that uh, are doing, or like want to do exactly what you just said because they have cleared stage one, which is making available 
you know, they never be, they never had before this volume of transactional documentation in, in a variety of forms. Uh, and now that they have that, they're asking the next question, which is, how can we actually optimize processes or ensure our employees are aware of the full processes and pulling them up a level out of the transaction and into the process and, and what you just described is you know, accurate. I, I want to just uh, wrap this up with a quick story which I, you know, in this idea of thinking about experience, I, I don't know that we're not necessarily responding to market demand on this, we're trying to create demand for it uh, because it's intuitive to us that this makes sense but because it's not been done this way, it's not necessarily intuitive to the market to do it this way. Um, and I, I um, how many people have a minivan? No, we, we, we don't know what you're like at home. Come on, how many people have a minivan? Okay, anyway, so um, as you're aware, you know, most minivans now have five doors, right? So when Chrysler invented the minivan, right, they were the first one, they had the market share, they were the ones who came out with this idea, and they were, basically they owned the market. Ford decided they're gonna get into the market with the Windstar at the time, and they created, and their quality is better than Chrysler's, and so they created the Ford Windstar and started to gobble up a lot of Chrysler's market share. So uh, it came to a point at which you're looking for the next level of innovation, and they were thinking about this idea of the fifth door. So this was out there in the marketplace and the engineers were thinking about it. So Ford went out and what do they do? Market research, right? And they asked customers, what, would you, what do you think about a fifth door? What was the response? Yeah, a fifth door, are you crazy opening into traffic? I, I, this is no, it's, this is, I, I'm not gonna do that, that's crazy. And so what did Ford do? Not only didn't they build the fifth door in that model year of the Windstar, they put the fuel system in in such a place that on that model, they could never put in a fifth door because the, the door would come out over the, the gas tank. And so they could never actually have a fifth door in that, and they had to wait another year. They actually came out with the larger driver door so you could flip the seat back. Chrysler just said, you know what, we know that this is something that people will appreciate once they see it, because it's, it's not that difficult to see it through. So when you're thinking about ideas, because this goes beyond this, but thinking about things that come to, come to your desk, and this idea of critical thinking, the idea of, of putting it through some model in which, well, we've never done it that way, but that doesn't mean that's because we've made a decision not to do it any other way. We do it this way because that's the way it's done. And there oftentimes there will be opportunities to say, well, wait a minute, maybe there's a better way. And an opportunity to take a step back and think about what it is, what the experience is that you want ultimately the user, the end, whatever it is to, to have, and think it through through that lens because that may lead you down some additional paths with some additional opportunities where you could actually do it easier, faster, <clears throat> better, um, because it's, it's not the way it's done. And then all of a sudden it becomes the way it gets done. 